here. <coughs> so first, sorry about the delay. I went to the wrong classroom. I thought this is, for some reason, I thought Morton was smart. <laughs> All right, so <clears throat> today I'm going to talk about this topological analysis on the firm data. Okay? And this is a joint work with uh, Professor Day and our co-operator, Kenyon, and she's at the University of Copenhagen. All right, so, so this is the outline. We're going to talk about the firm, so I will give you a very brief introduction on the firm. I'm not an expert on firm, so we will uh, just give you a very brief introduction on firm. And then we will talk about our tools uh, to study this, this firm. Okay, this tool is called the computational homology and the persistent homology. So I will give you a very brief introduction. Okay? So I hope you won't be scared by those very abstract words. And then we will show you uh, show you what are difficulties and what approach we take to attack this problem. Okay. So firm, all right, I'm gonna cheat here. So I will ask our cooperator to talk about the firm. She is already in the labs of Ian Baker and Mary Albert at the Thayer School of Engineering at Dartmouth College, and I'm an Eigert Fellow. I study fern, which is old snow, on the top of the Greenland ice sheet. And in our lab, we're studying how snow that falls on top of the ice sheet undergoes compaction and densification and records climate information that gets trapped in the ice. Snow that falls on top of the ice sheet doesn't immediately become ice because snow in these regions of the ice sheet rarely melts during the summer. Instead, snow becomes ice by undergoing densification from the overburden pressure of snow accumulating on top of it from successive snowfalls. This process creates a zone at the top of the ice sheet called the fern column, which is comprised of snow that has fallen this year, as well as layers of fern that have fallen over about the past 200 years. And this zone lasts for 80 meters. Because the fern column is made up of layers of snow and fern that have not yet reached the density of ice, there is an interconnected pore space lasting from the surface all the way to the bottom of the fern column in which air from the surface can blow through. When the fern at the bottom of the fern column becomes ice, it traps a bubble of air. And since air from the surface can flow through the interconnected pore space from the surface to the bottom of the fern column, the ice layer traps a sample of air that's close to present day. Whereas the ice that's forming the ice layer fell as snow 200 years ago. This creates an age difference between the air trapped in the air bubble and the ice surrounding it. It's easy to know the age of the ice layer because we can count back layers in the fern and ice just like tree rings. But it's hard to know the age of the air trapped in the air bubble. My research is generally aimed at understanding how long it takes air from the surface of the ice sheet to flow through the pore space and reach the bottom of the fern column and get trapped in the ice layers. I look at this process in one place, in New Greenland, where we went in 2009 and collected fern samples. When we analyze those samples back in the lab in New Hampshire, the first way I look at them is by measuring the permeability. Permeability is a measure of how easy or hard it is to have air flow through the pore space of the fern sample. And this gives us an understanding of how easy or hard it is for air to flow through the different parts of the fern column. The second way I look at the fern samples is using a micro CT scanner. The micro CT images allow us to look at the structure of the fern and pore space and relate that to the permeability of the fern in those areas. The final way I analyze the fern samples is by carefully looking at all the layers in our 80 meters of fern core. In these layers, I can see differences in density and grain size and even two melt layers. And all of these things tell us about how the surface of the ice sheet was in the past. 
My hope is that the permeability, micro CT, and layer data will help us to understand how the air flows through the pore space of the fern column and allow us to model the age of the air in the bubbles better. This will allow us to interpret the timing of past climate events in the ice core record with finer resolution. Okay, so, so long story short, the reason we like to study the fern because uh, it somehow records the climate information. So uh, the research like Caitlin trying to understand the fern structures and so, uh, all kinds of things can understand uh, the climate information. Right? So the main questions here is how, how to understand the structures of the fern samples as you see in the, uh, in the video, in the, the, especially the micro CT, you can see uh, a lot of like a small bubble there or some sort of structures there. So we try to uh, study the fur, the structure of the fur and sample. Okay. All right. So our tool is called the computational homology. So here I'm going to try to take this as a black box. There are very uh, sophisticated theory behind this. But here we just take it as a black box, okay? So what is the homology? Homology is very good at counting the number. So what number are we going to count? So it can count the component, this connected component, and it can count the holes, and it can count something called the pocket. So for example, for example, if you have something like this, it's very easy to see you have three different line segments. So if you think about the computational homology as some black box, so if you throw in this thing into that black box, and that machine will count the how many is component in this object. So in this case, I have three. So that machine will tell you, okay, there are three disconnected components. Okay. So likewise, if you put something like a circle. Okay. This is a one disconnected component, and because of this circle, it creates create a hole. So this is called uh, a hole. So if you put this thing inside our machine, you, it will output one disconnected component and one uh, one dimension hole. Okay, so that's that's our tools here. So the pocket, you can think about a basketball. Just a basketball. What's inside the basketball is full of air. That's the air pocket. If you put that basketball into that machine, that will output, uh, it will tell you there is one disconnected component, because the ball is one component, and it has a pocket. Trap the pocket. Trap the air inside the ball. So mathematically, it has a special name. This is called the beta numbers, right? So the, the disconnected component is called beta zero. One dimensional hole refers to the kernels or refers to the, the hole we see here. This is called beta one. And beta two is a two dimensional hole. Think about the air pocket. OK. So uh, before I move on, I want to point out there is some limitation in this machine. Okay? The machine cannot tell the size of your component. So for example, if you have the length of one segment here and length of a hundred, length of a thousand here, the machine couldn't tell the difference between those two, those three. It will just output, okay, there are three connected components. Okay? Likewise, the machine cannot tell the difference between this square or this, something like this. Because from the topological point of view, those two objects are the same. So, so keep in mind, those are the limitations we have. All right. So the machine I just mentioned is called CHAM. This is Computational Homology Pro uh, Project. And this is uh, it's in a big group at Rutgers University by the uh, Konstantin Mashaikov. 
Okay. And here's the advisor of Professor Day. He has a, a, a huge group on co computational homology program and the project, huge research going on. And here we just take it for granted, all right? We take it as our machine and we can compute, we can count the big numbers. So for example, if you have, your object is like this, if you put this thing into what's called chunk, this machine, and what you get will be a one, because this is one disconnected component, and because there's a hole here, then this is called beta one is one. Okay. And here you notice I do a, a square here. Okay. I did it in purpose because the framework we are at is called the cubical complex. You can think about the cubical complex as the world built up by the, a lot of Lego pieces. Okay? So that's called the com cubical complex. Another complex is called the simplicial complex. So that's the world built up with a bunch of triangles. Okay? So something like this and 3D version of this. Uh, out of my limits, I can't draw that picture. That, okay. That's called the simplicial complex. Okay, that have a different different aspect. But here we focus on the cubical complex. Everything is built up by the lack of pieces. All right. So, so before I okay, this is called the persistent component. So before I move on, right, just keep in mind, this machine can count the number of Bayesian numbers. All right, so now I'll move on to this thing called the persistent homology. So what is the persistent homology? Right? If you look at this picture, now you, we are in a world like, suppose you collect the data, this is called the point cloud data. If you collect the data from the cloud, Sorry, that should be my email. <laughs> and this is always what you've got, right? You collect the data from the cloud, and this is a fuzzy, fuzzy look like things. But if you look at carefully, our main power is very strong, right? If you look at this, this, this thing roughly looks like you have a, so you have a hole here, roughly, right? And, something like a donut perhaps or just a circle right here that's what we can do but what about the computer right? if you put in a computer what computer can tell that's another story so this is what the persistent homology can help us so the persistent homology can tell you in some ways can tell you okay roughly speaking this thing is a circle Roughly speaking, this thing is a circle. That's what the persistent homology can tell. Okay, so let me give you a precise, uh, precise, concrete example how that works. Imagine the, imagine this data. This is the data we talked about before. It's a very circle, right here. It's a circle. And suppose when you collect the data, you somehow introduce the error or the measurement error or some sort of error, then instead of the black, so think about black should be one, white should be 10. So what the data should be, it should be one, 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 and 10 here. But what you really got is some noise here. You maybe have three here, three here, two here, two here. Two here. So think about not the binary. So now this is the world of a grayscale. So now this might be some, when you look at this picture, this thing, this is a gray color, this is a gray color too, so this will somehow look like a circle, roughly. Okay. So how does the persistent homology work? Okay. You can, think, uh, that's the big idea here, we compute the Bayesian number at every threshold. 
in this way. Okay? So you vary the threshold from the minimum value to the maximum value. And then you compute the value and the current threshold. If the value is less than the current threshold, then you fill in the black as black. Otherwise, nothing fill in. Okay? So in this example, what you will see is when threshold equals to 1, and this value is equals to 1, so you fill in this black. And because 3 is greater than 1, you don't fill in that black, so that will be white. So the first thing you see, you have a one disconnected component. Okay. And we will record this information, a beta zero generator born at one. And when t equals to two, now you see one is less than two, so I fill in this block. And three is greater than two, so I don't fill in this block. And two is equal to two, so I fill in this block. And now you can see there is two disconnected components. And I say a beta zero, another beta zero generator forms at two. All right, so when t equal to three, now you can see when t equal to three, this thing, this thing grew together. And now you have a circle. Right? So now your beta becomes one. This is disconnected component, and this one represents the whole here. And when t equals to 10, and everything will build up, right? It will be one disconnected component. Okay? So that's the, the, the general procedure. And because of this thing, we can look at, uh, this is called the first coordinate, and this is called the gas coordinate, and this is called the lifespan. So let's look at this one first. So there is uh, a beta zero bones at two and dies at three. So what does that mean? Let's go back here. There is one beta, beta zero bones at two. At this threshold, this is a new beta, new component of bones. But at threshold equals to three, this component disappeared because this component grew with the, this one. So this component dies. So we said this component uh, has a lifespan of one because it forms at two and dies at three. Okay. And likewise, and likewise, there is one disconnected component forms at one and never dies, so we put uh, infinity here, okay? So this is the beta zero, beta one. So there is one uh, disconnect of the whole, forms at three and dies at seven, so it has a lifespan seven. So how do the computer tell it is a, a, a circle there? Well, we just look at the, the long lifespan generator. Years. Uh, this is in fact a group of people, researcher in the uh, Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, they have a group. They study the, this conflict region of the, the system homology, and they argue that okay, uh, the show light generator are really the noise. So somehow you can ignore the show light generators, and the low light uh, generators are usually the robust features. Okay, so in our example, our low light generator here, this is our low light generator, is the robust feature, which is a circle here. Okay? All right, so let's try to do a much larger example. Imagine I have a 3D block it's five by five by a hundred, so it's five by five by a hundred. It's a cylinder here, and just a toy model. I put one hole in the, in the middle. Okay. 
So to see uh, to see this long life generator and the short life generator, I try, I'm going to add a noise on the on this on the on the object I have. And this is what we got. This is called a persistent diagram. This is the first coordinate, and this is the desk coordinate. You can record that coordinate and plot onto this thing. So if you look at this 10% noise, you have uh, some noise here. Right? And you can see this is very, very small, whereas you have a very robust feature here. So that tells you that right, this is a, a circle. So that really verifies uh, verify this result here. Right? This short life generator are usually in the noise, and the long life generator are really fast features. So as I increase the noise, you can see the robust features always stand out here. Okay. So well, by this example, you can see this how the computer will fill out how to look at this fuzzy data. Okay, just looking at the persistent diagram and look for the long life generators. Okay, so let's move on. Okay, let's talk about the real data here. Any questions so far? Right. So the real data looks like this. Let me show you. So this is what Kellen just mentioned. This is called a micro CD data. Okay. It is a three three D image, but we cannot display the three D images. So what we do is we take a slice of this three D image. So now what you see is the three D the, the slice of it. Okay. You think about a rectangular box, and I just take one slide, and one slide, one slide. There are think of 800 slices. So here, this here, this is the ice, and the black refers to the air. Excuse me. <coughs> okay. You can stare at this. Some near picture will happen. And let's see, there's a face here. <laughs> All right. So now this is the persistent diagram look. You say, okay, this is persistent diagram look like, and deal with it. But it's 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 very hard, right? You just compute the persistent diagram, and so what? Now you get a huge data like this. And how 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 would you say the structure is there? Okay? And furthermore, what do you what can you say about because in previous slide we said a long life generator are usually the robust. So, so did you consider this one as a long life? Or did you consider this one as a long life? So it's not so clear when you have such crazy data like this. In previous, what we have, it's very, very easy to see, okay, that's, that stands out. But that's not so easy to deal with, okay? So what we do first, the first thing we do, we try to understand just by looking at the pictures, can we classify uh, different samples? Because Kalen has so many different samples, we can make this technique somehow we can classify different samples. Okay? That's the first thing I'm going to show you what that can be done. So another mathematical term, this is called the Euler characteristics. This is defined to be a beta 0 minus beta 1 plus beta 2. If you, 
this is called photo characteristics okay, in, in this fancy way. But I believe when you in high school or maybe in the middle school, uh, you learn something uh, vertex minus the edges plus the faces is always equal to 2. Right? So that's the thing, that's the generalized version here we have. This is the beta view of this connected component, edges, uh, vertex, and this is number of poles, and think about the edges, that's the line there, and that's the air pocket. Okay? So we, we consider this order characteristic curve. What do I mean by that? I, I can compute the order characteristic at each threshold. So for example, this threshold, this might be some threshold. Oh no, this is the threshold. So at the low threshold, the, the image will just look at very, uh, it's get connected. As you increase the threshold, the image will become more, more spongy, more spongy, more spongy here, and eventually it will become all black. The first, it will look like all white here, and eventually it will become all black. <clears throat> okay, so this is called the owner characteristic curve. So we compute this at the first question. And those two researchers, Richardson and Weirman, they have a very nice paper. It's a, in the engineer paper, I believe. They use this thing as a classifier. You can, yes? Well, I was going to ask, is there like a certain goal you have? Like, do you want your oil characters to be super low or super high when you're measuring these layers? That's a very good question. So we, we don't have that. We just, you know, well, we don't have that expectation. Just, you know, this is the picture they, this is the grayscale picture they have, and they just flash, flash, uh, move the threshold and compute all the characteristics. It just All right. So they can use this as a classifier. Okay. So what do I mean by that? They can classify just like a machine learning technique. Here I have a mic on here. And I have a horse here, minus hands, and a dog and a cat. If you compute the other characteristics in some way, I'm not going in, into the detail, but you can give this image, you can compute the other characteristic curve. And what's good about this is you can do a classifier. Right? Just by looking at the other characteristic curve, they can tell the difference. For example, the Michael, the other characteristic curve for Michael is a lot different than the dog. So that's what they use to, to classify. And if you are interested, you can look at their paper. They have this rigorous justification, they have this whole comparison. And this turns out to be a very, very good classifier. So we took their idea. We took their idea and we tried to compute uh, the order characteristic curve the same way, and we try to see whether we can classify just like they did here. Okay. So this is the first sample. So I compute, here I'm not compute the 3D, I just compute the persistent homology for 2D for each single one of them. Right? So you can see for each single one of them there, their oil characteristic looks very, very similar. Okay. They all from the same sample. So they all prefer very, very similar. And this is another sample. A different depth, I believe. 
a different sample here. <coughs> There's some fluctuation here. And we have to understand that. But if we just look at these two examples, what happened here is this is like there, and this one you have another curve like that. So clearly, right, those two look a lot different. So maybe we can, by their results, we can conclude that, all right, those two are really come from a different sample. So if she gave us another sample, maybe we can just calculate the oil characteristic curve. If that behaves like this, then we can say, OK, that's maybe on the same depth. That's our problem. But, yeah. OK. Another approach we have is we can try to create a very good binary image. If you remember, if you remember here, okay, this is called a micro CD data. So now this is really a bi binary image. Okay. So how do they get the binary image? Usually what they do, they average. They take the median one or they take the average one. But here we have a more, what we thought is robust way to create a good binary thing. So here is what we do. Okay? Here you compute a very small sample of the resistance. That Now you can see a lot of show light generators appears here, a lot appears there. And this is the long life generator, it pops up. This is the beta one, this is the low show light generator, show light generator, the those robot features pops up. Okay? And a very interesting point here is you can see there's a gap there. It's a gap sometimes in between here. If you choose your threshold correctly, in this way, if you choose this threshold, so you can see this is something like 150, and the threshold is usually, when you do the grayscale images, it's from 0 to 255. And this is like 150. So if you do that, then you will exclude this show life generator, which can be the noise, which can be the error. If you choose your threshold like this, you can exclude those show life generators. Then what you have is, you can just count. Right? The beta ba number will be 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 1. And it's robust because I don't count this show life generator. But this has to be very small. So if you do that and then go over the, the, the whole sample, so you do this, this test on the small sample, and then you move on on your own data, and then that's what we call the adaptive threshold techniques. So that's what we have do through all the samples and compute. Uh, so that's the result we have. If you, if you use their, uh, their classic method, if you may use like the median or the average, so the beta, uh, the beta number will become like 633 and 53. Whereas when we do the our method, adaptive threshold method, this is the baby number you get. You have 6, 32, and 18. Now you can look at here, why there are the big difference in here. And our explanation is, remember what I said here. You can't tell the difference between the small component and the large component. So what happened there is, if you choose your threshold badly, 
you may include some small, small feature, a small bubble there, which may not be the real feature, maybe just some measurement error or something like that. So that's not the, the correct number we believe. Whereas if you look at our number, if you do our method, it's dramatically changed uh, to 18. So we, So the last we like to say about some mathematical justification, why would you why would we see why would we see this picture like this? We have a lot of shoreline generators here, a lot of shoreline generators here. We think what happened here is if you think about the underlying function, our feature as as a state function. This is my this is my air, for example, and this represents my ice, for example. That's the true feature. Imagine this is the true feature. That's the step function is our true feature. And when you collect them, usually it will introduce some arrows, and because you take the picture, somehow you have to smooth them. So we think that's what happened. We think this is the truth, is the step function. And the data is collected because we have the error, and we smooth this step function and have some error. And if you compute the persistent diagram of this thing, you will get something like this. And you can see there are so many show life generators here, show life generators here. That really mimic that mimics what we see in the true data. We have a lot of show up generators here, this here, and in the transition part there are much generated. So we believe that's what happened. And thank you for your attention. Questions? So in your curve of this uh, Betty number, uh, I guess uh, at one point getting very negative, one point getting very positive. So yeah. that basically means uh, for the minimum is a uh, but either one is very large, I guess. The, the other one is, is a, I don't know, beta zero or beta two, uh, very large. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Because you can think about, uh, think about this picture here. At a low threshold, really everything is white, so you don't have anything. Mm -hmm, As yeah. you increase, <coughs> you start to form the kinetic component. And up to here, you will form a lot of terminals. So that's why we have a lot of uh, terminals right here. And when you keep increasing that, that terminals get pinched in. Once your terminal pinch in, somehow you will become uh, a pocket. And that's why that will increase this. So this is, I, we believe this is called beta 2. Because imagine you have have a terminal like this. Suppose a terminal like this. As you increase the threshold, if you fill in this block, mm -hmm. and if you fill in this block, and this terminal becomes a cavity here. And that's why if you have a lot of terminals, and when you fill in a lot of that terminal, that will become a lot of cavities. That's what How long does it take to produce a graph like that from the data, like on average? I think you'd be doing a lot of data. Well, it's fairly fast, I think. 
So I don't know about how they compute it, but for me, in this curve there are roughly 800 curves in this, 800 curves on top of each other. For each curve, I took roughly 30 seconds to a minute. But what's the limit of the size of the number right now? Oh, it's a bit of a story. So the size, I forgot, it's something by 500, by 500, by 500. So there is some limitation on the size due to the software limitation. You can't do, you can't do the full, full sample. So that's why here I just do one slice at each time. And that's why you can take over cyclone, right? Yes, that's why maybe we can take the cyclone, the high performance the computing nodes in the William Mary. So it seems like in the graphs where you have that diagonal line that was running through it, where you kind of determine the robustness of mm -hmm. various uh, characteristics or generators. Um, it seems like all the really robust ones tend to come early on. Is that just some kind of general trend um, that's happening there? So are you saying that this long life is happening early on? Right? Yeah, like it's, it seems to me that the, the, all the very robust generators mm -hmm. tend not to become born later on in the threshold. They would have less time to yeah. robust. Yeah. So, like, yeah. you know, I was wondering if, because it, it seems like the robustness is determined by the vertical distance from the diagonal line. So, exactly. in terms of like calculating the robustness of things that are born very late, mm -hmm. I was wondering how you factor that in, or if it just tends to be that the very robust things are all clustered early on. That's a very good point. Uh, so, they're, they're defined to be robust because they exist for many thresholds, a wide range of thresholds. So oh, okay. the robustness is defined by the lifespan. Okay. So it's a little bit circular. I see. And the, the guess is that the robust features correspond to what you would want the true features to be given that data. Okay. But like if you have like, you know, some generator that's born at, you know, a very high threshold close to your cutoff. And then you can't really can't tell. Is there like a hundred units length, and you've got something that, that is truly a hundred, but it's reading seventy-five. They can only be born between zero and twenty-five. Mm -hmm. So it's it's born so early on as a result of the nature of the technique. But you could so related to John's question, which is a really good one. You could imagine taking any of these examples and compressing the data, right? So maintain the same range, but shift, linearly shift the values down. Right? And what effect would that have? It would, it may increase oh, it's something that's very long lived, right? Or may increase the lifespan of something that was born late and died late and compress all the other lifespans. And so you gotta ask the question, I mean, do you want a measurement that's robust with respect to that sort of um, linear rescaling of the data, right? And that, I would say that's the one feature that doesn't feel very topological. Because what Yumin was talking about earlier is this is, Betty numbers are a topological measurement. Its topology is like floppy geometry, right? So you take a circle and you stretch it and you start deforming it and it looks the same to a topologist, but a geometer would be really upset. So um, the, the idea of a lifespan is much more of a geometric idea than a topological mm -hmm. idea. And I think that it's, you know, it's turning out to be a really powerful hybrid approach, but it's definitely a hybrid approach. And so in terms of it being a topological measurement, that, that's the one part, I think, the lifespan is the one part that doesn't feel very topological. So next next speaker again. Okay.